Joining us now to, to survey this little China news today is John Quelch, Dean of the Business School at the University of Miami. Welcome back, Dean Quelch. Thank you. First of all, what is your take on the story that we just reported, this continuing swine flu, swine fever, I should say, epidemic, which seems to be driving an increase in the Chinese inflation rate and this unusual uh, rise in fresh fruit prices by nearly 27 percent in May? Uh, it's important because food prices are um, very visible to uh, Chinese consumers and uh, uh, Chinese consumer confidence can be uh, affected negatively by these kind of dramatic spikes. Um, on the uh, swine front, one of the things to realize is that the agricultural sector in China remains extremely fragmented. There are literally millions of uh, small farms and small producers across China. And so while Beijing has done a very good job of uh, developing national standards for food safety, uh, the level to which an inspection service exists across the range of provinces in China remains limited. And as a result, enforcement of the standards at local level uh, on behalf of consumer protection uh, remains somewhat uh, weak. Um, as a result, you have uh, uh, these outbreaks, which um, are not necessarily nationwide in scope at this point, but uh, they are spot outbreaks which end up disrupting supply chains and causing considerable inflation in individual cities, uh, individual markets. Um, there's no doubt that the uh, weather-related factors in southern China have uh, seriously affected uh, fresh fruit production. But this is also interesting because Chinese consumers, as they've become wealthier, more and more of the middle class are looking to buy fresh produce. And so, again, uh, at the market, if there is a considerable volatility in uh, retail prices, uh, that uh, has an impact on uh, consumer confidence and consumer trust in the government, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hong Kong has been in the news with the protests against the law that would out allow uh, extradition to the People's Republic of China. Now the Hang Seng Index in uh, Hong Kong is recording its sharpest drop in five weeks. Could this uh, political controversy have a lasting economic impact in your view? I'm not sure about a lasting economic impact, but the Hang Seng is down 11 percent off its 52-week uh, high. and. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things to note here is that we've just come through the 30th anniversary of the events in Tiananmen Square in 1989. Uh, these uh, memories of uh, Tiananmen Square uh, linger long and hard in Hong Kong. And uh, I think it's uh, been an example of perhaps uh, um, political naivete uh, that the administration there has uh, uh, promulgated this extradition um, legislation um, around the time of the Tiananmen uh, anniversary, the 30th anniversary. And that, that has had a provocative effect on the uh, uh, large student population in Hong Kong, which uh, is always very keen to uh, uh, defend uh, democratic freedoms and sees the extradition uh, legislation as really uh, quite draconian, allowing uh, for any Hong Kong citizen or anyone on the street in Hong Kong, in fact, to be uh, detained and uh, um, transferred to mainland China for trial. Mm -hmm. And uh, back to the dispute with the U.S., it's probably too soon to invoke the Cold War as a reference for this uh, trade dispute, but there was a notable drop-off in attendance from China at the annual Select USA Investment Summit here in the United States, hosted officially by the U.S. Department of Commerce. Just 76 delegates from China attending this year, reportedly down by half from two years ago. Is this a special case because of the direct involvement of the current administration in that event? Or do you see a real trend starting of uh, a division in these conferences that seemed for a while to have put aside national allegiances? Well, Chinese overseas direct investment has fallen precipitously in the last uh, three years. And the numbers for China investment into the U.S., for example, were uh, 55 billion worth of investment, dollars worth of investment in 2016, falling to 9 billion in 2017, uh, falling to 5 billion in 2018. Um, 
overall, uh, China has redirected its foreign direct investment away from the U.S. and Europe uh, towards Belt and Road Initiative countries. Um, but uh, this is not to uh, detract from the fact that the drop in the U.S. foreign direct investment is particularly high. Part of that is a function of U.S. regulators blocking Chinese acquisitions in the U.S. In fact, last year, uh, approximately 14 deals, um, potential acquisitions, were blocked by uh, the U.S. under the uh, CFIUS regulations. And as a result, obviously, the actual numbers for foreign direct investment into China, uh, from China into the U.S., are falling. Uh, so the attendance at this conference is really a reflection of these realities. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. A lot of that decline apparently is, uh, as you note, due to uh, official decisions from CFIUS uh, sort of declining that uh, Chinese investment. I had to get your reaction to White House economics spokesperson Larry Kudlow, who said on Arrival Network that the U.S. could still hit 3 percent growth for this year, even if there is no resolution of the trade fight with China. Uh, is that a credible prediction? Uh, I think it remains a credible prediction. Um, obviously, the recent uh, job creation numbers were relatively low, and uh, recent uh, manufacturing order numbers have been a little bit soft. Um, but the Fed, of course, has indicated that it stands ready to uh, enter the fray with a rate reduction if uh, needed to uh, keep the economy humming along. Um, it's worth noting, of course, that the U.S. GDP growth, uh, if it's 3 percent for this year, uh, will still be uh, half of the GDP growth in China, uh, which is forecast to be between 6 and 6.5 percent for 2019. Right. And another head-turning comment this week came from the head of the U.S.-China Business Council, who said the U.S. was trying to murder Huawei. He basically alleged that the White House could have banned, uh, simply banned Huawei from U.S. infrastructure, but their actions indicate uh, ambition beyond that to not just keep them out of U.S. systems, but put them out of business. What's your reaction to that claim? Well, obviously, Huawei is a flagship national champion company for China and for Chinese technology. It's, it's a wonderful company. Um, it's uh, uh, brought terrific innovation already to uh, the marketplace in, 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 in many markets, not just in, uh, not just in consumer um, uh, smartphones, as we, as we have seen. But beyond that, uh, they have very, very strong technology. And one of the things that we're seeing gradually is that this tariff war is morphing into a technology war where the United States is using um, blocking tactics to try and slow down uh, competition uh, that might uh, gain a march on U.S. competitors worldwide. So by preventing um, U.S. companies such as um, uh, Google and Microsoft and so forth uh, from selling their products or servicing uh, Huawei products. Um, they, of course, are making Huawei products potentially less attractive in the global market. So right. even though Huawei sells very little in the United States as it is, um, if uh, these actions on the part of the U.S. government uh, prevent uh, Huawei accessing technology upgrades from its U.S. suppliers uh, or buying Qualcomm chips, etc. Uh, that is potentially going to slow Huawei down uh, right. and therefore put a little bit of a break on Huawei's ability to dominate the 5G networks globally. Excellent insights from John Quelch, Dean, at the Dean of the University of Miami's Business School. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.